It's a really a great pleasure to be here with you today, uh, and I really have to thank uh, Florian and the Center for Law, Technology, and Society for extending this very kind invitation for me to, to, to be here and to be able to spend some time uh, with you. Hopefully, uh, this conversation is going to be helpful uh, to you. I'm not sure um, how much you have been studying slash researching on Right Be Forgotten, uh, but even if that's not your specific uh, area of interest in your research, I think the Right Be Forgotten, or the so-called Right Be Forgotten, it's really uh, an interesting entry point for us to think about uh, the road that we have ahead of, uh, ahead of us on issues concerning uh, internet, regulation, uh, free speech, data protection. So that's a very good entry point for us to understand the complexities that we might face ahead when we uh, talk about issues concerning all of those, all of those topics. Before I get into uh, the right we forgotten itself, let me just introduce very, very briefly uh, the institute from where I come from, uh, because that might be helpful uh, for you in future uh, activities and research that you might be uh, doing. So uh, we are ITS, the Institute for Technology Society of uh, Rio de Janeiro. I actually need to update this slide because that's our former view. Uh, we changed office uh, right now to a place that uh, um, Professor Florian uh, thinks that we have a better view now. Uh, Professor Florian uh, has been a fellow from our uh, institute uh, for a while now and has becoming a, 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 a frequent visiting professor in our, in our courses uh, in, in, in Rio. So ITS is an institute that has been created four years ago, actually five, uh, but it's, uh, it's a part of a joint project on a work together that a couple of professors have been developing in the last 15 uh, years. So it's, it's pretty much safe to say that uh, me, Professor Ronaldo Lemos, and Professor Sergio Branco, we have been working together for 15 years now on issues concerning uh, internet policy, law and internet, and ITS is the place that uh, ended up uniting us all uh, for the last five years. So we have four areas in which we end up developing our activities. Uh, rights and technology uh, is the area that uh, I end up doing most of my work. Uh, we have an area on education and we offer uh, very frequent online uh, courses on several issues uh, concerning law and technology. An area of uh, innovation that deals mostly with blockchain and startups uh, in Brazil. And an area on democracy and technology. I'm going to go very briefly on a couple of activities of uh, ITS. So we are uh, somewhat connected to a very recent history in Brazil in creating a Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights. So I'm not sure if you are aware about this, but Brazil ended up approving um, uh, something that we call a Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights in 2014. That was the very first time in which the, the government in Brazil created uh, online platform for people to contribute and to comment on a draft bill of law that ended up being sent to the National Congress and then being approved as a federal law. So Brazil nowadays has, uh, uh, from 2014 on, uh, this law on quite different topics such as intermediary liability, free speech, net neutrality, data protection, all into this more broadly framed uh, law. We call it Marco Civil da Internet, but I'm switching to Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights because as far as I understand, Marco Civil might look as the, sound like a name of an Italian soccer player. So let's uh, stick with uh, Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights. The interesting part of this initiative is that uh, we end up helping the Ministry of Justice at the time to review the comments that have been made in this online platform. So it was really interesting to see the diversity of comments that different sectors and different actors 
end up posting online, such as a regular internet forum in which people can uh, agree, disagree, comment, add suggestions. So it was really rich to see this debate developing online and creating uh, this, uh, this law. So this law was approved, as I said, in, in, 2000, in 2014. Uh, and we have been publishing a lot on this law since, since then. We have just published a book, unfortunately in Portuguese, that we review uh, 200 uh, judicial decisions uh, enforcing the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights. And this is something that is interesting to mention. Uh, right after the Brazilian law was approved, the Italian parliament ended up uh, creating an initiative to establish something that they call uh, Declaration of Internet Rights. So Italy, as well, has its own Internet Bill of Rights, such to say, but the, the Italian document is more like a soft law, a uh, suggestion to judges and to future legislators on how to address issues on uh, Internet regulation. The Brazilian example is a federal law, it's a hard law. So judges uh, apply this law on an everyday basis, and we end up doing this review on how this law has been faring so far uh, in case law in Brazil. So we have been doing a lot of work on this. Uh, this, is our, this is our team right now. I really like this slide because you have uh, the research team on top and you have the directors uh, out down here in the bottom. This is probably like a, how we feel most of the time. Uh, and we uh, are now spearheading the secretariat of the Global Network of Internet and Society uh, Research Centers. So we call it NOC, Network of Centers. This is a network that uh, right now uh, includes uh, more than 80 centers, uh, in, mostly in universities throughout the world, that end up doing work on internet and society. I would say a good chunk of the centers are uh, grounded into law schools throughout the world. Uh, but this is an interdisciplinary network, and we are now putting an extra effort to make sure that uh, the network lives to this, uh, to this idea of being a truly multidisciplinary uh, network and can bring along other centers that offer different perspectives, not only on internet policy, but can enlarge the scope uh, of analysis that we do. Uh, that network was created in 2012 uh, by our friends from the Berkman Klein Center uh, at Harvard. And the secretariat, uh, the leadership of the secretariat changed every two years. So after that, we had our friends from the Humboldt uh, Internet uh, and Society Center in Berlin. Uh, then our friends at Nexa Center at the Politecnico uh, di Turin in Italy. Uh, and then us. Uh, so it's really it's really a pleasure to 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 spearhead the secretary of this network, and let me just uh, conclude this uh, this part of the of my presentation, which is not um, well, not already talking about what I'm supposed to do, uh, but just to say that the network might be a really interesting uh, opportunity for you to engage in some joint research, especially because CLTS is part of the network. Uh, and we would love to see uh, more activities being done together uh, with the center. So last year, we organized this big event in Rio, in Brazil, on artificial intelligence and inclusion. Uh, it's pretty much clear to us that uh, uh, a lot of the joint research that we are going to do is going to focus on AI, especially on AI and inclusion uh, in the forthcoming years. So we organized this event uh, in Rio, bringing uh, to, to the city more than 100 professors and researchers throughout the world to discuss issues on AI and inclusion. If you uh, want to take a look uh, on the outcomes of the event, uh, the website is, is me doing all wrong. Uh, let me see if I can. Um, LP print, next to previews. Let's go with next to see what happened. Just a second. Mm. It's so nice when you have problems with technology and you don't know how to solve this. Mm -hmm. If I make and show might be a bad idea, let me just try to do something else. <coughs> 
Sorry about that. It's going to be quick. There we go. So if you want to take a look, it, this is me uh, pressing the wrong button. This is the website uh, up here. So aiandinclusion.org. Uh, you will uh, have access to uh, reading materials uh, of this uh, of these events, uh, the videos of all of the panels, uh, and some research questions that we end up. Uh, having all the participants to answer. So it's a really good uh, research source if you are doing some research and writing and studying things on uh, AI and law mostly. But I think you, you'll find it really, really interesting. So this is uh, one of the things that we do uh, in the network. Another possibility of engagement is uh, all of the centers of the network, or a good chunk of them, might end up offering fellowship opportunities uh, throughout the year. Uh, uh, we at ITS uh, regularly offer uh, an opportunity of fellowship uh, in our winter, and I can guarantee to you that like, uh, our winter is um, <laughs> the weather that we're having today. Uh, so that's the peak uh, of our of our winter, so if you want to come come down to to, to, to Rio uh, during June and July, uh, every year we offer this opportunity of uh, of fellowship, and that will be another good opportunity for us to 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 get a little bit closer on what you're doing and what you're researching. Uh, not only ITS, but different centers from the network offer these opportunities. And this is just me concluding this part of my presentation. Uh, which might be like a shamelessly uh, marketing uh, what we do, but by the end of the day, looking at the bright side, I think it's uh, uh, help you to think about opportunities of, of engagement. We at ITS, um, we also develop a project that I'm, I'm very happy to take part of, which is called Mudamos, in Portuguese it's uh, We Change. We have uh, one provision in our federal constitution that says that if you manage to have 1% of the population that is uh, able to vote, to sign up to a petition uh, requiring the Congress to uh, analyze one specific draft bill of law, the Congress needs to take this draft bill of law, turn it into an actual bill of law and analyze it, examine it, and finally, well, refuse or approve. Uh, but since this was uh, inserted in our Constitution back in 1988, there has never been a case in which this provision has come to life. There was this one single case uh, in which uh, one provision uh, ended up gathering a lot of uh, uh, widespread support, but then one congressman ended up getting the very same text and presenting it uh, as its own. Uh, but the fact is, uh, so far, this has not come to fruition, mostly because people challenge the validity of the signatures of people who end up signing in paper the petition for this specific draft view of law to be analyzed. So what we have done with the Mudamos app is to create an app that would allow uh, people to sign using blockchain to uh, draft views of law in every single level of the federation, so in the federal level, the state level, in the municipality level, uh, and we were super happy to see how popular the app uh, ended up turning. Uh, we have been uh, the app that has been received most downloads uh, at the App Store and the Google Play Store uh, uh, in a couple of months. So right now I think we have 700,000 uh, downloads of the app, so it's, uh, uh, it's pretty impressive and I'm really happy uh, to be able to put up that. So this is just to give you guys a uh, a bigger uh, overview on what ITS does, what the network does, and if you haven't like heard enough from me, we have the other talk on Monday. What I will do is to try to present you a little bit more with some more details the network uh, in the talk of the Monday lunchtime. So I will reserve a good 15 minutes uh, uh, of the presentation on Monday on elections uh, and disinformation, uh, not only because I have some uh, very frightening feelings about what's coming up uh, in Brazil in the elections in the next uh, uh, 15 days, 
But um, I think we can use the start of the presentation to present you a little bit of some uh, opportunities of engagement uh, in the network of centers. So having said that, let's talk about the so-called rightly forgotten. That was the topic that I've, I've been asked to talk about. So um, if we resort to uh, a couple of uh, ideas that might help us out to see where this discussion is going, uh, we can start with this question. So to forget, it is a virtue or it is a flaw? Is it something that is positive or negative? How do you want to engineer uh, the ability to forget in the age in which it looks like we're always remembering things because we are inserted into social networks that keep, uh, keep remembering things in the past because there are search engines that allow us to retrieve information that used to be uh, long, long forgotten. And it's interesting that if we turn to uh, Greek mythology, which most of the time is a good uh, starting point for 95% uh, of all discussions on Earth, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the etymology of forget, uh, it will take us to the word uh, liti, or, or leto, uh, in, in, in the radical in, 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 in Portuguese and in Italian. And leti, or leto, it's interesting because it can be uh, portrayed in Greek mythology either as uh, the river that flows in the Hades, uh, in the underworld in which people would immerse <coughs> themselves in order to forget what has happened uh, in previous lives. Uh, so this is uh, one, uh, uh, um, this is just like a one way to frame this idea of letis, letu, that will lead to oblivion and to forgetfulness uh, later on. Uh, it's a river, the river of, of, of forgetting. But it's also the name of a nymph, uh, of a female deity, that is the daughter of discord. So it's really interesting to see that uh, the forgetfulness uh, in Greek mythology is not only the usual rem remembered river of, uh, that you immerse yourself to forget things, but it's also the daughter of discord. Because discord is pretty much what we see right now when we engage in every single discussion concerning right be forgotten. People would think that this is a fundamental right. People would think on the other way that there is no right whatsoever. Uh, we're just complicating things in an unnecessary way. So my idea with this uh, very brief presentation is to uh, get your ideas around 10 points that might be important for us to consider when we address uh, the issue of the so-called right be forgotten. Uh, I had the opportunity to do this presentation uh, in front of the Supreme Court of Brazil in a public hearing concerning one case that is now pending decision on the right to be forgotten. So that is uh, exactly what I ended up presenting uh, in, the Brazilian, in the Brazilian court. <coughs> of course, uh, not only translated into English, uh, but also uh, adjusting to the conversation that we are going to, to have right here. Uh, I know that we are going to have some time later on for questions, but at the same time, I'm, I'm cautious about your agenda and schedule throughout the day. So let's make this more of a conversation rather than having like uh, me talking about this uh, uh, this topic uh, for the entirety uh, of the time that we have. So if you do have comments, questions, uh, please do raise your hands and let's uh, let's make this more of a conversation and rather than uh, like uh, me talking uh, without stopping about those things. So 10 points about the right we've forgotten. Uh, first, an issue of concept. We might be getting this concept uh, in a slightly problematic way. Uh, is there a better way to conceptualize this? Maybe right we've forgotten is sending out the wrong message. Uh, a second point on architecture of the network in which uh, to remember is the rule to forget uh, looks like to be the exception. A third question asking us, can we ex ante decide if something is not worthwhile to be remembered and uh, therefore it's um, an appropriate object to be, to be forgotten? 
Uh, fourth, does the right be forgotten as established in the decision of the European Court of Justice does not legitimize the um, empowering of corporations as being judges on uh, what can be shown, what cannot be shown uh, online, and how this connects to uh, the broader discussion on intermediary liability online. Five, uh, two questions about enforcement, five and six. Five, um, are we moving towards a global enforcement? Mm -hmm. uh, and I know we have the Equistack case here in Canada that is not about right to be forgotten, but tackles the issue of global implementation. Uh, and six, does it provide uh, incentives for selective damage in which you end up filing a lawsuit or arguing against a one specific search engine but not the others? So how does it fare uh, against an idea of offering a more integral uh, protection uh, of the human being? Seven, the, well, the astrising effect, always, always remember. Um, eight, I want to briefly talk with you about some experiences in Latin America because I think that's uh, something that Latin America might offer as something very unique to this debate which is how this can offer an opportunity to rewrite the history uh, when you have very young democracies, some, some of them still struggling, and right be forgotten can plug in into a whole discussion of amnesty laws, um, making it impossible to talk about some specific crimes committed during the dictatorship period. And then we conclude talking about uh, impact on speech protection, and to see how uh, countries in Latin America are legislating uh, on this topic. So, as you can see, we're going to s probably be here until 6, 6.30 uh, p.m., but um, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, and, and guys, if you can sign me, like, uh, if I'm going way beyond time, uh, please, please, please do. And if you want to grab some extra food, please do. Uh, it's not the fact that I'm, like, a, here speaking in front of the food that would uh, uh, restrict you from having access to it. I'll, I will even speak from this side, so you don't, <laughs> so you don't feel embarrassed, uh, um, and, and feel free to do so, okay? So, uh, first thing on concept. So, it's important for us to uh, examine closely the idea of something that, that is being called right to be forgotten. So, first of all, I know this is pretty much clear. I know this might look simple, but I think it's an important entry point to this discussion. No judicial decision can provide the effect, can fulfill the promise of having someone or something being forgotten. To forget about something is the result of something else that is ordered by a specific judicial decision. It's been either the removal of one specific content, it's either the de-indexing or the listing of one specific link, but neither the removal or the delisting leads automatically to forget about this specific content, to forget about this specific link. So I think it's really important for us to try to be precise. And it might be uh, a really like a wrong way to begin the conversation if we don't get the concept right. So if we begin talking about uh, a right we've forgotten, which is something that by the end of the day is a false promise. So uh, no judicial decision uh, can lead to this to this uh, effect. So this is something that we might want to play along throughout this, uh, throughout this conversation. Like the right to be forgotten is not something that once ordered by a judicial decision will get every one of us to simply forget about something. Like this is not a Man in Black movie uh, in which the right to be forgotten will make sure that the enforcement will lead you to forget something as quick as this. So this is important. Um, as we had in the previous slide, I really like the way uh, Catalina Botero, it's the former rapporteur for uh, free speech from the organizations of American states. Uh, Carolina has said in a, in, a, in a recent seminar that right be forgotten is not a legal category, it resembles a more emotional category. 
And I like this idea because it forces us to think why Right Be Forgotten has became something as catchy, as got this uh, very quick uh, worldwide uh, recognition, if not on legislative level, but at least people end up feeling attached to this specific way to uh, connect to this specific debate. Is it because it involves emotion? Is it because it might offer a silver bullet uh, that might counterattack uh, a way of um, hyperinformation in which we have access uh, to information in a very uh, uh, new uh, way? So why Right Be Forgotten seems to be uh, so catchy? Do we have any any ideas? Why do you guys think? Why Right Be Forgotten got so got distraction like so so easily? Go ahead. I think pretty much all of us. What's your name? Uh, I'm Nick. Um, I think pretty much all of us feel like we could be embarrassed by something we posted online. Hmm. Like there's something that maybe I was 14 or maybe I was 19 that I put on <laughs> Facebook or Twitter that I kind of wish. Not I had you. It. Someone else. <laughs> Someone else. Precisely, yeah. But that's a good guess. So it's something that order us or give us some form of protection. So you might never know. It might be something that you even don't remember that you have posted online, but might come back. So it's a, almost like a personal protection tool. But you know what? What I think is interesting on in your comment? It's a personal protection tool against yourself. Uh, so. This might be something that we might want to remember, no joke intended, uh, in, this, uh, in this situation. But very good point. So it's a protection. Go ahead. Um, I also, and what's your name? Nicole. Nicole. I also feel like it's a really interesting time right now because it's, one of the, you know, it's been a long time since shaming has been so public. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, like, it hasn't been for hundreds of years where, like, people would just go to a swear and shame people now on the internet. Mm -hmm. Everything is just, it's so much more public than it was maybe 30 years ago or 40 years ago. I see. So you see, right, be forgotten um, as a way to make sure that the, the shaming that ended up happening in one specific period of time end up being concealed in that specific period of time? Um, I guess not necessarily. I just think that's maybe why it's more point and more of a poignant question mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. um, just because of its nature, because it's so public, but um, and why it's more relevant. I see, because one thing that uh, uh, in your comment that I think it's really interesting, when you think about shaming, you are mentioning something that at one specific time seems that a lot of people end up got traction to uh, communicate that to achieve one specific goal. That might change over time. So you might say that the people, uh, the person who was uh, uh, the, the target of a, a name and shaming initiative might change his or her mind, might want to give a second try, and that thing will be there forever uh, being something that is tagging her through all eternity. So it'll be a good thing to allow people to come clean after this thing. Question is, if we move this to uh, the issues concerning the press, um, how media portrays specific things, you end up having a lot of case law uh, in Europe, but also in Latin America, that might resort to the idea that information might serve different uses or different uses, usages on different times. So at that specific time, that information was important to be delivered that way. But after five years, 10 years, 15 years, that might not serve the original purpose. So, and that's the problem, you have uh, one Italian uh, uh, judicial decision that on that regard, uh, you have uh, one in Colombia as well, uh, that says that after some time, we don't need to have this widespread access to this type of information. And that's something uh, I know that you're talking about shaming, 
but we might uh, bring the very same uh, perspective to media coverage of something that people in the future might uh, rely to the argument that that thing was not important anymore to be readily accessible to anyone who wants to have access to it. And this whole idea of the passage of time might be important not only in shaming, but in issues concerning uh, media as well. I might think that some of you might disagree with what I'm talking about, and you might think that, no way, if that was published once, this is value information, this is relevant, and everyone should have access to it uh, anytime. But at the same time, people uh, who defend this type of position, in which I really like to say it's not mine, uh, they would say that the way that we re relate to information, that changes. And to think that everyone should have access all the time to every single information that has ever been posted online, it's something that is simply not in alliance with this idea that we change, the way we relate to information change, the way we access information change, and the right we forgotten could be one remedy to make sure that we are getting it right. My counter argument will be that uh, we have other legal tools to attack this problem without simply erasing the information. I think we have right to reply, I think we have uh, some, some other countries right to reply, right to response, uh, the information might be updated. Uh, I think we have other uh, resources to play along here. So this is just to let you know that this conversation, I think it's important for us to have right in the beginning, because it showed to us, like, uh, why do we care about this topic? Uh, how this is being framed uh, uh, elsewhere? And this is something for us to think. What are the reasons for its worldwide spread? So that is item, that is item one concept. So two, this is very quick, uh, architecture, the internet seems to be made in a way in which to remember is a rule, to forget uh, is the exception. So that comes from the very uh, architecture of a decentralized uh, network, of a network of networks, in which information tends to endure, uh, and creating uh, obstacles for it to be to be erased seems to be something that is connected to the very uh, DNA um, of the internet. I know this might sound like super simple, but it uh, end up uh, igniting one follow-up question, which is: if it's in the DNA of the internet for things to be remembered. If we want to create something that we call right to be forgotten, that means that this right to be forgotten needs to be engineered. Tools, resources for it to be implemented had to be uh, made, created. And here we can fall on a very usual trap, which is to think that simply inserting uh, this provision in the law will make it happen. And I'm pretty much sure that you've uh, heard at some point uh, this whole idea that law alone will not solve all the problems of the world. So we need to see things on a slightly larger perspective. And I really like uh, like being uh, working on this field for a while now. It's really interesting when we are able to resort to things that have been said uh, in the late 90s. Not only because it shows that this uh, uh, whole, well, I'm not going to call it a field, but this whole area of uh, legal studies concerning internet uh, and law, it's nothing that is that much new. I know it's not Roman law, uh, it's not history of law, we're not talking about the Hammurabi code, uh, but it's good to know that we have uh, at least uh, a good two decades in which, uh, I would say even a little bit more, that uh, we have uh, a lot of discussions on law in the internet. And that allows me to resort to the every frequently uh, quoted Lawrence Lessig's uh, idea of um, law. You guys have uh, read or know about uh, Cody's law? 
and what LASIK has been uh, written like uh, in the late 90s on the code and other laws of the internet, it was a famous book at the time. Uh, that was interesting because the idea that LASIK brings along uh, in the late 90s is that uh, when you think about what is the regulatory force that drives your behavior, law is just one part of the puzzle. We need to think of this as a tug of war of four points. One is law, but the other three are uh, the markets or economics, uh, social norms, and finally, uh, what he calls ar architecture. We can talk as technology. So I know this is, sounds super simple, but uh, it's really uh, powerful in the way that you might be able to easily see that approaching only through a legal perspective make you, might make you lose sight from uh, what are the, the, the economic forces that might drive uh, your behavior, drive your behavior to this or that direction. How society understands this behavior, uh, is it acceptable or it's uh, rejectable? And how technology might make it easier for things to be done or not? Uh, and that's one thing that I think is interesting on the right we be forgotten. Because we might at some point decide that there is something that's called right we be forgotten. Okay, but how do people feel about it? How do we have economic incentives for information to be deleted or not? And how technology might serve as a tool to make it easier or not? So this is important for us to make sure we talk about the architecture. So thinking about our third point is, can we decide ex ante if something needs to be deleted or not? Now let me give you one example from uh, Brazil. So this gentleman here uh, is our former president, Lula, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Uh, he was very much involved uh, uh, with uh, labor's rights uh, in, the, in the 70s. He ran for presidency a couple of times. He got elected uh, in, for two terms. Uh, he was the president of Brazil. Uh, but he was, um, back then, uh, a mechanical worker in one big factory uh, in the state of Sao Paulo. And he had a labor accident in which he ended up losing one of his fingers. Um, that time, when this guy filed, ended up filing this lawsuit, he was just uh, someone who has been through a labor accident and it was claiming damages and compensation from what has happened. And he was, uh, he was compensated by that, but the actual files of this uh, judicial process, they have been erased. They have been burned in order to open up space in uh, the judicial archives, in the physical buildings. And that's a common practice with uh, very old uh, uh, um, judicial processes, uh, not only in Brazil, but throughout the world. But the thing is, if we make an analogy between this and what the right be forgotten might deliver, it's something really interesting, because when people decide to erase uh, Lula's uh, uh, physical process, uh, judicial process in which he claimed damages for the accident, it was just like a one out of God knows how many uh, lawsuits being brought by labor accidents or, or because of labor accidents. Who wouldn't know that this guy would turn out to be a president of the country? And this is interesting because uh, looking from today's eyes, how interesting it would be to have access to this uh, lawsuit, to know uh, what were the arguments, to see uh, something that is a good part, an important part, of the biography of our president. But this is gone. This is gone because at some point we thought that this was, was not of a great importance. So I know that that doesn't relate to the right we've forgotten, but it might be a good way for us to understand uh, the values that we are playing uh, with when we decide that something uh, can be targets uh, of a right to be forgotten uh, lawsuit or judicial order, and some things not. Um, there is no joke intended in this slide. Uh, President Lula is now in jail uh, due to corruption scandals, uh, which is a pretty sad situation. Uh, every time I end up having some Brazilian politicians on this slide, some of them might be 
might be in jail due to corruption scandals, don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, on a very personal note, I have voted for, for the guy for a while, uh, and uh, I have my own strong opinions uh, uh, about this case, but that's not something that we are uh, uh, going to go on right now. So, this is just to say that it might be tricky to uh, see what exactly needs to be uh, the target of a uh, right to be forgotten. So there was a draft, sorry, there was a bill of law that was discussed in the Brazilian Congress that is a really interesting one. Sorry, this is in Portuguese. Uh, you know, the good thing about having uh, me giving out these lectures that we can use those times to train your Portuguese as well. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure that this could be a side effect. Uh, of having me in the center for a while. You can see that Professor Florian uh, Portuguese is improving uh, quite a lot. Um, our goal is for Professor Florian to give uh, out lectures in Portuguese uh, on the right to be forgotten in Brazil quite soon. We are making a lot of progress. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in this uh, draft, in this bill of law, it was not approved, okay? Uh, that was uh, a bill of law that was uh, submitted to our National Congress by the President of the Chamber of uh, Deputies, the House of Representatives in Brazil. He's in jail right now uh, due to corruption scandals. So uh, Representative Eduardo Cunha at the time, uh, now in jail, um, uh, suggested this provision. It's mandatory the removal of links from search engines on the internet that makes reference to data that is, one, irrelevant, two, outdated, uh, by initiative of every single citizen or do the request of the person involved. So, irrelevant and outdated, and everyone could ask this specific uh, content to be struck down. Uh, now that this representative is in jail, you pretty much make the connections. It's not uh, hard to connect the dots. So. Um, what this guy was aiming at the time was to make sure that he could uh, take down from the internet uh, media reports uh, on corruption scandals and such. Uh, but sometimes it's easier to connect the dots, sometimes it might be trickier. So this is just to say that uh, to decide ex ante might be tricky. And uh, in some countries in Latin America, politicians might, for several different reasons, try to insert into the legislation very broad provisions, such as this one. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit quicker, because I might uh, think that, yeah, we might want to speed up a little bit. Uh, so, four, are we legitimizing the judgment of corporations uh, on deciding of what should be uh, forgotten or not? There might be one uh, undesirable effect of the Costeja case. So I think you guys might know, but if not, this is a very brief uh, synthesis. So what happened is uh, on uh, May 13, 2014, uh, the European Court of Justice decided the so-called Hugo Spain case uh, concerning this gentleman, Mario Costeja. Uh, I know the date by heart, not because I'm really interested in the right to be forgotten, issue, but that's because it's my birthday. <laughs> uh, so thank you, European Court of Justice, uh, for giving us this awesome gift, uh, the gift of right we forgot. So uh, Mario Costeja uh, is a citizen uh, from Spain, from Catalonia, uh, and at some point in the past, he has to sell uh, one of uh, the place uh, that he used to live. Uh, to pay his uh, debts. And that information was uh, there in a newspaper called La Vanguardia, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, newspapers, in, if not the biggest, in the region. Uh, and uh, more recently, when the past editions of this newspaper got digitalized, it was able to uh, search for his name uh, at a search engine. And then that information that was published in the newspaper back then suddenly came back alive and he could see the very same information back again online. And when people Google him, that was the very first information that appeared. So he ended up uh, 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 filing a, a lot of uh, 
uh, processes and tried to get this uh, delisted, excluded. And he finally made, after a, um, a long procedure, an administrative procedure uh, with the Spanish Data Protection Authority, to make sure that search engines will be able to de index or delist that information from the search engines. Uh, and that led to uh, a widespread of people sending out notifications to search engines to de index or to delist one specific uh, information. A couple of uh, information that might be important here. So, what the European Court of Justice decided was that people are able to send out to corporations or to search engines, companies, uh, links that they don't want to appear when they search for their name. So this is not disappearance of the link entirely, and this is something that is important for us to keep in mind, because uh, some courts worldwide are thinking that what they are doing is to the least that information means that that specific link should be removed from the search engine as a whole. And a more restricted view would say that what it's asking here is that when you search for this specific uh, name, that specific link should not appear under search engine. The reason I'm mentioning this is that, for instance, in Brazil, we right now have a judicial decision that said that this specific link should never appear, it doesn't matter what you end up searching. That's not what might come out from the European, the European decision. But this is important to mention because uh, one effect of the European decision is empowering companies by end of the day to say if something is uh, able to be there or is going to be delisted. Thing is, what are the parameters? What are the conditions? What are companies looking into in order to make this decision? Do we know? Is like a Google uh, applying one specific uh, set of rules that they analyze, hopefully someone, not a machine, analyzing it to decide if that thing might be kept or be delisted? The tricky part is that when we uh, gladly give up of judicial scrutiny, we might lose a lot in terms of transparency, a lot in terms of accountability on how decisions are being taken. I know that it connects a lot with the discussion of intermediary liabilities and the discussion that we're having right now in the US with info wars and some of other topics. I really would like to go back to this uh, issue with you next Monday when we talk about elections and disinformation. But the, the, the issue that I want to uh, you guys to pay attention right now is that a right to be forgotten as the one that comes out from the European uh, uh, Court of Justice decision might lead us on a way in which uh, companies are, well, not able to do so, but compelled to do so without any mm, good measurements on what are the parameters in which this is being done, how can we have access uh, to a better way in terms of accountability and transparency and due process on what has been done uh, in order not only for academics to review, but for good policy being done out of, out of it. So, uh, question five is something that uh, I really think it's important here, is to think about, okay, so once the European Court of Justice uh, ordered the search engines to delist content, should they delist it only in the country that the person is uh, applying, only the country in which the person who is requesting for comes from, or they should delist it on a global scale, on a global level. And that was the specific topic that is now pending decision on the European Court of Justice uh, for a new decision on, uh, on the grounds of the right to be forgotten. So that was the, the CNIL, the, the French uh, Data Protection Authority, uh, challenged 
the idea that Google should only delist uh, the information from the google.com dot, for example, CA or dot BR for Brazil or dot FR from France. So the idea is that once Google is ordered or decides to delist something, it might or it should, sorry, done it uh, on a global scale. So it should be delisted from google.com and not from google.ca, FR, or BR. And this is interesting because if we think about it, and I know that's a question that has appeared uh, uh, in Canada uh, already in the Equistock case. Uh, if we think about in Russia, for instance, you have a lot of uh, regulations that end up restricting what they call gay propaganda. So a Russian judge can block one specific form of speech because under that national law, that specific content is gay propaganda. And we had a lot of discussions about it during the last uh, soccer uh, World Cup. So if a Russian judge could uh, decide that one specific content is gay propaganda under Russian law, does he or she has the ability to restrict this specific material not only from Russian uh, websites, but can it be uh, a restriction that will have worldwide impact? We can think the very same thing with Thailand, for instance. Is it a crime in Thailand to criticize uh, the royal family? If a Thailand judge uh, can decide that one specific blog post that is a crime under Thailand's law uh, should be taken down, stroke down, should it be removed from forever, or should it just like a uh, block uh, using like uh, IPs from Thailand or something like that? So my concern here is that when it comes to uh, discussions on the right, be forgotten. We might, when we focus that much on a global implementation, on a global enforcement, we might end up creating the precedent that might be exploited in some different cases, in some different discussions, to lower the barrier for free speech by its lowest form of protection. Because I'm pretty sure that the conditions for something to be portrayed as gay propaganda or criticism to the Thailand royal family in Canada does not apply, or you will have different standards. And, well, you might have the right to have access to this type of content in Canada. You might not have the right to have access to this content in their home country. So this is something that is crucial for the debates on internet and jurisdiction. Uh, if, you guys have, if you guys have uh, interest in this topic, I would recommend strongly that you take a look on one initiative called Internet and Jurisdiction uh, um, Policy Network. Uh, if you search, from, if you search uh, in your preferred uh, search engine, uh, it might not be Google, it might be DuckDuckGo, uh, Internet and Jurisdiction. Uh, um, policy network, you will see a lot of materials that this uh, really interesting network has been uh, putting up uh, in the recent years. Um, I'm part of the, of the group, Professor Teresa uh, as well. So it's, um, it's a good uh, resource uh, material for you guys to take a look on. Um, and just to conclude this thing about the enforcement, we might want to take a look on how people end up claiming damages on issues concerning right be forgotten. Because most of the time, uh, Google, is the, Google is the defendant. So Google is in the other side, so Google is the opponent. Uh, but of course, it is due to Google market share. But at the same time, uh, if we think about that someone felt damage uh, by this specific link appearing in a search engine, the fact that uh, he or she is not bringing a lawsuit against a uh, bank, uh, DuckDuckGo, or other search engines, does that does not weaken a bit the idea that there is a fundamental right at risk? So you feel damaged by this information appearing on one 
uh, search provider, but you don't feel that much uh, about that specific topic appearing in other search engine. And that might be something for us to, to keep in mind. Point seven uh, is the well-known Streisand effect. Uh, I'm pretty sure you are familiar with the name. Uh, if not, that comes from Barbara Streisand uh, because of the uh, somewhat well-known uh, case in which Barbara, that, that's Barbara, <laughs> some of you are quite young, so you might not have Barbara Streisand as a, a cultural icon, uh, as some of you uh, slightly older in the room might have. So uh, she wanted one specific uh, photo uh, of her house to be struck down from the internet. And I'm not sure if you ever had the curiosity to know where Barbara Streisand lives. You might have some other uh, <laughs> areas of uh, interest in your life. Uh, but once Barbara Streisand uh, tried uh, that hard, to get her house out of this website, people end up paying attention. So what's wrong uh, with Barbara's place? Uh, where does she live? And then the photo of her place end up being uh, repeated, being posted in a number of different forums and different websites, and that became a thing. So the Streisand effect is named after uh, the actress uh, to say that uh, once uh, people try to very hard for you to forget something that might backfire, that might create the, alter, the opposite effect, which is you end up remembering way more something that you were ordered or that people try to make you forget. So, and that's something that happens a lot on cases of the right be forgotten. We wouldn't be calling or talking about uh, Mr. Costeja if he had filed a lawsuit to be forgotten. So it is, it is quite a paradoxical thing that uh, the gentleman that ended up igniting the whole debate of the right to be forgotten uh, in search engines uh, in the European level couldn't be forgotten. Uh, he, he got the judicial uh, decision that he wanted, but he didn't got the effect of being forgotten, which is pretty much our first point. So I think this is something for us to take a look on. Uh, and the same thing comes uh, with different cases throughout Latin America. We had one case in Brazil of one uh, model, uh, top model, uh, that she was caught on tape. Um, I, I'm not showing this right now, so uh, it's totally safe. Uh, she was like, caught on tape uh, having sex on a public beach in Spain at the time, like a uh, why? But the thing is, uh, once this was uploaded on YouTube, as you can imagine, Brazilian YouTube users kept uploading, re-uploading, and, and YouTube at the time, that was 2006, could not take down this video whatsoever. Uh, so it's interesting that she filed a lawsuit to claiming damages and ordering the removal of the video. Uh, right now, through AI, it's more easier to get the video flagged uh, and, uh, and, and, and stroked down from uh, one specific platform, but, uh, well, still not 100%, and, of course, she's now mostly remembered by the video. So uh, she wanted this to disappear. What she ended up getting was the very opposite effect. So I'm getting towards my uh, the end of my presentation. Um, because I want to save you some time for uh, questions, comments. So I, I only have uh, three points. So one is, uh, how do we tackle the idea of right to be forgotten and the rewriting of history, especially in a Latin America perspective? So this is really, this is really important, and that's a topic that is very uh, dear to me. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the coordinator of the uh, Data Protection Authority of Argentina, uh, Eduardo Bertoni, uh, at the time when he was a professor at the University of Palermo uh, in Argentina, wrote this uh, article uh, that is very critical of the idea of the right to be forgotten, 
saying that this was an insult to Latin American history because that would give people the resources to make sure that crimes uh, committed during dictatorship would never be remembered again. We were giving legal resources for people to hide behind the shields and make sure that those, uh, those crimes or those uh, conducts were never ever brought to light. So what we have right now in Latin America, in every single country that comes from Chile, Argentina, Brazil, is the creation of uh, a lot of uh, what we call uh, truth commissions. Um, comissões da verdade, uh, comissões da verdade. Uh, groups that engage uh, without, most of the times, official support, but sometimes with official support, to investigate crimes being done during dictatorship time, and even without uh, the possibility of uh, prosecuting those who were identified as being the responsible, because in some countries you might have an amnesty law that simply make it impossible, at least at first, uh, for you to, to hold uh, these people responsible, but at least bringing to light what happened. Sometimes uh, the perpetrators of torture or crimes might be already dead, uh, but even, even the fact of bringing this to light serves a purpose uh, for all the reasons, and sometimes that might be even trickier. So for instance, uh, right now, and you don't want to get me talking about Brazilian politics right now and, and elections, but uh, the guy who is now uh, leading the polls uh, in Brazil, it's pretty much in favor of uh, <coughs> the economic and social development that Brazil experienced during dictatorship time. So he's very fond of the, of the time uh, in which Brazil was a military dictatorship. Uh, we can, of course, uh, criticize on a number of uh, 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 stances this specific behavior, but the one thing that I want to uh, uh, put some light on is that when you don't even allow those uh, uh, incidents of crime and torture to being brought to light, it's easier to you in the future for any or every uh, imaginable purpose for you to end up resorting to the spirit of the past and using it to your own uh, purpose, to your, the way that you want it to. Might be for political reasons, might be uh, to make a case for one economic model, might be for any and every uh, specific, specific reason. But uh, there is some importance on having truth commissions on itself, on themselves. And that might be something that the right be forgotten might serve as an opposition. So uh, we see that a lot in countries in Latin America, the people say, right now we want to remember, we don't want to forget. So the right to be forgotten might be arriving in Latin America, if not for all reasons, in a very wrong time, in a time in which people want to remember more. They don't want to forget. Quite the opposite. Uh, they want that information to be kept. So I'm talking about the, the situation in Brazil, but in Colombia it's even worse. So Colombia uh, now it's definitely more complex because we have been through a situation in which uh, uh, a group called FARC uh, that uh, used to be a paramilitary group that now turns into a political party uh, and it comes from a situation in which uh, there is a big pardon uh, in terms of things that happened in the past as a sort of an, an agreement to make sure that peace is established in the country you can imagine that uh, for uh, parents of victims of crimes uh, committed by this group, that is really hard uh, to make this transition. But at the same time, what the, the president ended up uh, uh, spearheading uh, at the time was the idea that that was a difficult but an important price to pay in order to pacify uh, the country. Uh, I'm not Colombian, I'm Brazilian, even though I'm talking about Latin America, I cannot even begin to understand how complex this situation can be uh, from people uh, in Colombia. But what I know, speaking with uh, my friends there on the ground, is that Right Before Cotton comes in a very bad moment. 
because that's going to be the trigger that can be used uh, to actually make sure that things that happened in the very recent past of the country are not brought to light. So this is just to give you an example that uh, when you think about rightly forgotten, you might think about this one Spanish guy in Europe uh, getting this one specific information that might be uh, not relevant anymore or to him being struck down or delisted and you might think like, a, hmm, that might not sound of a big problem. But when you look at how this uh, very same concept might be used, you see how dangerous this can be. And let me offer you another example that's nothing to do with Latin America. Uh, the Court of Appeals of Karnataka in India recently ended up uh, issuing a decision on the right to be forgotten, uh, saying that the right to be forgotten is an European concept of a right to protect the modesty of women. That's clearly not why the right to be forgotten was framed in the first place uh, in Europe. But it shows how different courts might react differently to one very single concept that was created for entirely different reasons. So this is just my point on us looking into Latin America, see uh, how the situation might be different. Um, almost my last point, impact on speech protection. I'm not gonna go like a really into deep uh, details here because we don't have time to do so. But uh, we had a very interesting case in Brazil concerning this TV host, uh, she called Xuxa. Uh, XUXA. Uh, she used to be probably one of the most famous uh, celebrities in Brazil in the 80s. She used to host a show for small kids uh, on TV um, uh, with cartoons and such. But before that, she made a movie in which there is a one specific scene that, well, she has a very intimate contact with a minor. Movies from Brazil from late 70s, don't ask. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, um, once she became a celebrity, uh, working with small, with small children, it was of her interest to make this movie disappear and she filed all sorts of lawsuits to make sure that that movie disappeared. So she filed lawsuits against like the Brazilian blockbusters to make sure that the VHS uh, uh, um, tapes were excluded. Uh, she filed lawsuits against Google to make sure that no search engine whatsoever would make sure that you get like uh, uh, snapshots or even parts of the movie online. Uh, and in one specific claim, uh, that got to our superior federal court, she asked Google to do not uh, show any search results when people search for her name, Shusha, and pedophile or pedophily. And uh, the superior court of justice rejected that, uh, that request uh, and rejected on the grounds that the right be forgotten that she claimed at the time uh, could not be brought uh, against the search engine. If she had any problem on the content itself, she should file a lawsuit against the website in which the content was being uh, displayed. So that was a lawsuit against uh, Google as a search engine. There was not an, uh, a lawsuit against uh, YouTube, so she lost. But again and again, this case has been brought uh, in our federal Supreme Court. And I want just to conclude to say that uh, if you take a look on the case law, uh, so far you have very different flavors of the right we've forgotten in the case law in Latin America. I really like this uh, article by, by Gert von Kauser uh, and Alejandro Gonzalez and Emzik Uppers in which they do a, um, almost like a, a tour through Latin America to see the most relevant case law. I have talked about some of them. Uh, mostly Brazilians, but if you want to take a look, is there any way that I can make this presentation available afterwards? Yeah, I can send it to you so you might want to take a, a look on that. But let me go very briefly here. In Argentina, you have uh, two judicial decisions and Supreme Court uh, that address this topic. 
And uh, what the Argentinian Supreme Court has said uh, in the, those two times is that Google should not be held liable uh, for the content that is indexed uh, on its platform, um, at, with the exception of notoriously infringing content. So part of the civil society in Argentina celebrated those decisions saying, hey, this is good for free speech. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they might think like, uh, where this uh, manifestly infringing content might lead us in the near future. So even though platforms were not uh, held responsible or liable at this time, we are not sure uh, how this is going to move uh, in the future. Uh, and this is uh, one. The two cases, one is Maria Belen Gonzalez uh, versus Google, the other is Jimbutas against Google. I'm just going to mention this one and finish, uh, which is the, the case brought in the Supreme, Supreme Court of Colombia, uh, Gloria uh, against El Tiempo. El Tiempo is a newspaper uh, in Colombia. Uh, and Gloria filed this lawsuit not against Google, but against the newspaper, uh, asking this specific uh, news piece to be removed. Uh, it's interesting that the decision ended up uh, uh, not focusing on Google whatsoever, but ordering the newspaper to edit the, the file called robots.txt. That is the file that makes uh, the indexation uh, of pages through search engines. So order the newspaper to edit the file to make sure that the content will not appear in search engines. So this case is different because it's not a case being brought against a search engine, but against the newspaper ordering it to find its way to make sure that the content will not be available on search engines. Guys, uh, I don't have more time. I'm sorry to take a, a long uh, time of you. So that's just the Brazilian case that I've mentioned. And just to say, we have no uh, legal provisions uh, in the countries that I mentioned on uh, Right Be Forgotten. But I'll leave you with this one question, which is, now that we have the DPR uh, in force in Europe, and there is a provision that uh, people are saying that it's the provision of the Right Be Forgotten, is that going to have uh, an impact uh, in Latin America? Is this DPR uh, a game changer, uh, as people might uh, think? But we can save that for uh, another time. So those were my 10 points on the right, forgotten. Sorry for taking so long.